we continue our journey with Abraham. Uh, I'm going to call him Abraham because today we will actually officially begin to refer to him as Abraham about halfway through our scripture. Um, as you recall, in chapter 16, we found that Abraham and, and Sarai had, had, uh, had raced ahead of God and, and uh, had, uh, had a child through uh, Hagar the servant, and uh, that child was named Ishmael. It was not God's plan. We see that as uh, the story continues to unfold, and we move now to chapter 17 of Genesis. Chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household, or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household, or bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that same day, and every male in Abraham's household, including those born in his household, or bought from a foreigner was circumcised with him. Chapter 18. The and Lord, Lord add his blessing to this hearing of his holy word. There, there are certain Sundays where I go over my notes and go over my notes and go over my notes to such a degree that I look down and I say, what a mess. 
you know i mean if you could just see all the lines and things scratched out here and so I, I feel inclined on those days rather than to try to figure out what i meant when i wrote it down to just talk to you so today we'll share with you uh, a little more informal uh, message concerning what we just listened to i think of this uh, passage of scripture and um, somehow I, I i relate it to the world we live in because we live in a world of what might be called instant gratification right no, no i mean that's the world that we live in how else do you explain that in the year 1982 people on average were saving about 10 percent of their income and placing it in savings whereas today it's less than four percent that people save out of their income and it's not just saving let's be honest people borrow because they want it now they know what they want and they know when they want it and they want it now and so they borrow money now they go in debt to to have things that they just can't wait for they're looking for immediate gratification and it even transcends money and stuff right otherwise how could you explain that every time i walk by the cheesecake factory i am drawn inside towards that ultimate red velvet cheesecake do i not know that every piece of cheesecake there is 1,540 calories and 59 grams of saturated fat. Of course I know that that's a part of it. Do I somehow think in my mind that the nutritionalists have missed some hidden value that's found in this piece of cheesecake? No. I see it. I crave it. Sometimes I might even lust for it until I go in and have a piece. And it's not often, we only go there once or twice a year, so it's good we only go by there. But I have trouble walking past there because of immediate gratification. As I eat it, I am gratified. Does the gratification last? Only until I step on the scale the next day. But, but, but that's sort of the mindset of how we live. And that's why we make many of the decisions we make in our world today. It's about immediate gratification. And at some level, I fear that we look for that same sort of immediate gratification in our relationship with God or in our spiritual lives. Now, to be sure, there is immediate gratification in our relationship with God. I don't want to imply otherwise. I mean, the promises we have of God when we come to the realization that He has come and He has not only created us, but, but then He died for us so, we, so that we could spend eternity with Him uh, in heaven there ought to be immediate gratification in, in, in remembering that. But sometimes I think we think that, that, that we ought to reach the apex, apex of, our, of our spiritual journey immediately. We ought to have this deep relationship with God the very moment we trust in Him. And, and, and we're, not, we're, we're thinking we shouldn't have to work at it. We shouldn't have to take time and put into it. We ought to just be able to say, bam, I've got this deep relationship. And that's just not the way our spiritual lives work. It's not. It requires time. It requires effort. And we see this in the life of Abram, right? Thirteen years have gone by. I want you to think about that. Thirteen years have gone by. He was 86 when Ishmael was born. He is now, the Scripture says, 99 years old. He has not heard from God for 13 years. Not a vision. Not a dream. Nothing. I, I sometimes think, well, I wonder what he was thinking there. What was going through his mind day after day as he was not suddenly hearing from God for 13 years? He thinking, well, I'm thinking if it were me, I'm thinking, well, I blew it. I just blew it. I got out ahead of God. I took matters into my own, own hands. I blew it. Okay? God probably has no use for me whatsoever anymore. I messed up. But that's not the message that God gives him, is it? Because we, we open our Bibles and, and we hear the word. God, God, God comes to him and says, I am El Shaddai. That's the Hebrew word that he uses here. It's the first time in all of Scripture where he uses that to describe himself. El Shaddai. El meaning God. Shaddai meaning Almighty. I am God Almighty. And he then goes on to confirm his covenant, his promises that he has made to Abram. He, he, you know, and Abram, all he can do is just bow down, face down to the ground in holy reverence to his God. As an illusion, uh, or an illustration, I should say, of how worship will look like when we're in heaven. 
Because when you read the book of Revelation, you see all the saints, all the believers gathered around the throne of God and they're bowing down, face down, worshiping God in holy reverence. But, but, but we see Abram is overjoyed. He is overjoyed because God has is, is, is never left him. But, 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 but their relationship is once again alive and they're talking, they're communicating and God is confirming His promise. He's not done with them. Could have said, you and me, Abram, we're done. But no, He confirms His covenant to Abram. What a powerful, powerful uh, message of God's grace. Once again, Abram messes up. God in His grace keeps His end of the bargain. And it's wonderful. And, and God, as much as says, you know what, we, we haven't talked for a while, so here, here's, what, here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to um, walk before me. Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, now I, I, I sort of love the way God uses the word walk, right? First of all, God does not use the word crawl, okay? Secondly, He does not use the word sprint. You know, some people, they like to get in a sprint. Again, that's a sort of immediate gratification. They, they hear the good news, they believe they're overjoyed, and they just want to sprint. They want to sprint out ahead of God. They want to sprint in their relationship. They, they, they think about, again, immediately they can have it all. And, 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 and what happens is, what, well, let me ask you this. For any of you here today, outside of maybe some of you younger people, if you sprint a 100-yard dash, what happens? First of all, can anybody here sprint a 100-yard dash anymore? I, I can't. You know, what, what, what happens to me if I attempt to do that is I fall face down to the ground and I'm not worshiping, Okay. I'm exhausted is what happens if I try to sprint. But so often, I have met people who want to sprint. Sprint with God. They want to sprint and they want to do everything at fast pace. And, and, and they get out ahead of God and they become exhausted. They can't say no to anybody. They can't say no to anything. And pretty soon, they're burned out. They're flamed out. They, they, they sprint. God, God says, no, don't want you to sprint. I want you to walk with me. I've seen people crawl too. And they miss out on a lot of blessing when you crawl before God. When you crawl, uh, God says, just walk with me. That's how we get from one place to another, right? By walking. That's how I got from my car into the sanctuary today. I walked in. That's the way you get from one place to another. God says, I want you to walk with me. Spend time with me. That's the message. He, gets, he says, in conjunction with that, and he uses a conjunction to do it, he says, and be blameless. Be blameless. Not perfect. None of us is perfect. We all mess up. We all sin. It's not, it's not about perfection. The word here means more to be complete. Complete through your relationship. Striving to be perfect, but not, not, not that you're, you're going to get right all the time, but you're striving to be like me. It's this level of integrity and morality that we should always be striving for. And here's the thing. Uh, he, he, he ties the two together with the word and, and I believe what he's saying is this that you can never be blameless unless you're walking with me. He says, walk before me and you will be blameless is really the way that should read. You will be blameless. Now, you can try without walking with God to be blameless. You can, and, 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 and many of us have tried that before, right? We try really hard to do the right thing, to, to get things right all the time, but, but we're not really connected with God. We're not really you know, spending time with God. We just try to do it on our own power. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. You, you, you walk with God, and then through His strength and His presence and His guidance, then you are blameless. You are work, walking in a way that, that, that He sees you as righteous, but also as striving to do things His way. And so He, he gives this to, um, to Abram as a manner of instruction, and then He goes on to do what? He goes on to confirm His promises. Goes on. He says, "You're going to be the father of many nations." As a matter of fact, this is the point. This is the point where where God changes His name. Now, it's not as dramatic as say changing your name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. It's not nearly that dramatic. Changes it from Abram to Abraham. Just a, a subtle change. But all of a sudden, His name means father of a multitude. Father of a multitude. And that may not mean a lot, but think about it for a moment. Every time somebody called out his name, he was reminded about God's promise of his descendants that would be as numerous, numerous as the stars. It was, it was once again a reminder of God's grace. 
Once again, as he changed his name. And then God, God goes on to, to, to give him additional information, if you will, about his covenant and his promises to him. And, and he does it in, in sort of rapid fire uh, sequence. He, he, he says, um, I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will, uh, I will be their God. And so he makes these, 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 uh, these, this detailing of his covenant, if you will. Gives us more information. I was telling somebody today, that's sort of somehow how God works. You know, we oftentimes see or hear people who will say, you know, uh, we're going to give you information on a need-to-know basis. You've heard people say that before, right? It's on a need-to-know basis. I think God is the, the perfect uh, distributor of information on a need-to-know basis. He gives us what we need to know when we need to know it. And that's what he's doing with Abraham here. He's giving him what he needs to know now to continue to allow his faith to grow as he details what's going to go on going forward. And, and God pretty much says, okay, that, that's, that's, you know, that's what I'm going to do. He began the whole statement by saying, as for, for me, this is what I'm going to do. Confirms to Abraham this covenant. And then, then he says, and this is transition, mind you, he says, now as for you... As for you, you know, oftentimes we, we say that around the house, don't we, to our children? Denise and I used to say all the time, as for me and your mom, we're going to have filet mignon. As for you, you're going to have hot... No, we never said that. We didn't. But, 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 but as for you, this is his, his part now. This is his part that God says, uh, I'm going to do all this for you now. Now I want you to keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for generations to come. But what he's basically saying is, I want you to pass this on from one generation to the next. That they too, they too will walk with me. That they too will walk in a blameless fashion. So that when, when other people see Abraham, and when other people see Abraham's sons and descendants, they will see this walk that they are walking. They will see that they are striving to live a life that, that is pleasing to God. Uh, a blameless life. And they will say, wow, that's the sort of God that I want to worship. And it's no different with you and I, is it? God says, walk with me. Live in a blameless fashion. And, and, and so that other people will see. See your walk. So that other people will see your joy. So that other people will see the peace you have. And they'll say, Bad, boy, I, I want what he has. And they'll follow your God. So that's the message that God gives to Abraham. And he says to him that there is a sign associated with this whole deal. Now, it's not a matter of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the sign saving anybody. The sign is circumcision. He says every male child at the, on the eighth day will be circumcised. It doesn't save the child being circumcised. It is a sign. It is once again a reminder of the grace of God and His people. He is showing them this is what will be carried on from generation to generation. This is your sign. And we look at it and we say, okay, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And we, we come to this point where he now moves to Sarai. He's going to change her name too. From Sarai to Sarah. Again, a very subtle change. She will be Sarah the princess is what the word means. Which seems to be fitting, would you not say, since her descendants will be kings who rule over, over kingdoms. She is the princess. And God says, we're going to name her the princess because there are going to be descendants, there are going to be kings who are going to come from her. And, and Abraham's still a work in progress. He's caught off guard a little bit by this. I see some of you smiling a little bit when you think of, of, of Sarah, 90 years old, having a child. Some of you are thinking, man, I had a child when I was 25. And I can't imagine. That thought is just sort of, sort of silly almost. You see, at some level, initially, Abraham struggled with it. For a man to conceive a, to, to, to conceive a child, uh, if you will, or, or to uh, uh, participate in conceiving a child, that's not likely at 100, but it's not inconceivable. But for a woman to bear a child at the age of 90, 
It almost sounds ridiculous. It would almost certainly require a miracle, right? Abraham struggles with it a little bit, but God says, as a matter of fact, he struggles to the degree that he says, you know what, what? you almost had me there, God. <laughs> yeah, I know you're full of, you almost had me. It probably ought to be Ishmael, right? We ought to give the blessing to Ishmael. You know, all, all kidding aside, God, let, let's, let's, let's get back to Ishmael. And God says, no, no, I will perform a miracle. You will have a son through Sarah. And you will name him Isaac. Which again proves that God has a sense of humor because Isaac literally means to laugh. You know? And so it is that God says, this, this is a miracle I will perform in your life. And Sarah will have that baby. And they will name him Isaac. She at the age of 90, him at the age of 100. You see, God, God says, wait on me. Be patient. Abraham, he's a work in progress. Isn't he? It has now been 25 years from the time God called him to leave the county of Ur and walk in faith with him. And he continues to walk. Walk with God. Not sprint. Not crawl. But walk with God. And that's what God calls us to do. We're a work in progress too. He wants us to just walk with him. Walk with him and be blameless. Slow down. I, 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 you know, I, I read as I was preparing for this that, 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 that slowing down will, will remove from us a road that is strewn with re- regret. That was a quote. I don't remember who said that now, but it, but it, but it will, will take us away from a road that is strewn with regret. And you say, what's regret? My wife and I always joke about regret. Um, about every night about 9 o'clock, uh, one of us will look at the other and we'll say, you know what, I think we're going to have some regret. And, and, uh, and then we'll get up and we'll go over to the snack tray and we'll pull out some potato chips or, or, or some other snack. And, and it, it could be either of us at any given time. And then about 10 minutes later, we'll put the snack back. We'll say, okay, I do regret having had that, you know. Regret, something that if you did not do, um, you'd be a lot better off for it. Something that if you do, you feel bad about. The author's saying if we just slow down, we can remove a lot of that regret from, from, from our journey in life. Slow down and walk with God. That's what he's calling us all to do. That's what he called Abraham to do. And as I finished this message and I'm reading as I'm apt to, and I always love to turn to see what Chuck Swindoll has to say about any issue. Well, in this particular uh, topic of slowing down, he listed three benefits. And I thought they were profound, as I oftentimes do. Um, He said, when you slow down, he says, first of all, you will increase your discernment. By slowing down, you will increase your discernment. Think about that for a minute. When you are moving at warp speed, everything is just a blur. Discerning what other people need, want, or think is difficult. Discerning what God wants from us is virtually impossible, right? You're just going too fast. You, 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 you see things without recognizing them. You hear things without really listening. It just goes right over your head. When you slow down, discernment becomes so much more significant. You get so much out of, out of your walk with God. You get deeper in your relationship with God. I, I think of all the times, and, and, and I'm not looking for uh, approval or indictment here, but I think of all the times that I go through my uh, devotions and I'm in a rush, right? You know those times that I'm talking about where you've got a Bible in one hand and a timer in the other because you've got so much going on that day. You just don't know how you're going to be able to get through everything you have to do. And it is on those days. I don't literally have a timer in my hand ever, but, but I'm saying figuratively here. It is on those days that I read the Scripture and I'm trying to rush right through because I've, I've got important stuff I've got to do, God. And I think to myself, Now, what did I just read? And then I read it again, and I end up spending three times as much time as I would have if I'd have just slowly opened my Bible and prayed for God's Spirit to open it up and reveal His truth to me, and then just slowly read it. When you are in a hurry, discernment becomes difficult. It becomes challenging. God says, slow down, and you will discern so much more. He says, not only will your discernment increase, 
but your anxiety will decrease. I mean, think about it for a moment. When you slow down, you begin to feel God's presence, right? In a powerful way. When you slow down, you, you realize that you have an advocate, namely Jesus Christ, who is looking out for you, who is watching over you, who is guiding you, and it takes away. The problems don't necessarily go away immediately, but the anxiety and the worries do because you, you, you give it to God and you give it to Jesus. When we slow down and recognize that God is in our midst, it will take away some of the worries you have. And beyond that, here's the thing. Many of our worries come from being concerned about what other people think, right? How many people worry sometimes about what other people think? I guess I'm the only, well, a couple of us here. A couple of, yeah, but the closer you get to God, right? The deeper your relationship as you slow down and feel God's presence, the more you concern yourself with what God thinks and the less you concern yourself with what other people think. So that when you slow down, God removes those anxieties. And, and finally, when you slow down, um, you avoid some unnecessary tragedies in your life. You just do. When you're going again in, in, at warp speed, there is a tendency to make bad decisions in your life. Right? There's a tendency to make bad decisions, to, to not be thinking clearly, to not think of a process through properly. And Swindoll would say in, in, in this, in this uh, book I was reading that it is uh, when we slow down that we avoid some of those tragic episodes of our lives. For Abraham, 25 years, and he's still growing, right? He's still growing. And God says, just give it to me. Just surrender every aspect of your life to me. As if you were ever in control, but in the first place, I might add. He says, give it to me. And so the question for you and I becomes this. Do I want immediate gratification? Which, let's be honest, is nothing more than something superficial, right? Something fleeting. Or do I want something more? Do I want eternal gratification that can begin now and take me into all eternity? God says, don't sprint. It's not a sprint. It's not a crawl. You want eternal gratification? Walk with me. Take time daily. Meditate on my word. Get in a quiet place. Talk to me. Read your Bible. Walk with me me and you will be blessed beyond measure let's pray god i thank you for your word i thank you god that that that, that you give it to us and we might hear even from these stories in the old testament of your grace and of your mercy and of our need to trust in you always and 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 to fully God, wait on you and not get ahead of you. There are instances in each of our lives where we've done this. Maybe recently, maybe today, where we've got ahead of you, Lord. I just pray that you help us all slow down. Slow down and just walk with you. Have a closer walk with thee. That is our prayer, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.